Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com and we're going through a very unprecedented time really to go through this coronavirus change that's sweeping the entire world. It's not just hitting one country, it seems like it's hit every single country in the world, on the planet. Different countries are dealing with this crisis differently. And from a reality shifting perspective, quantum jumping perspective, lots of people are asking what is on my mind? And obviously, I'm going to keep asking how good can it get? I like to look at what's positive. It's always easy to do that when you train yourself to do it. If you don't do it, then you get different results. So I'm recommending it no matter what's happening. Why not pull yourself out of whatever seems like a tailspin right now? I highly recommend it. And the key today to recognize is that your many minds hold keys to selecting realities. And if you wonder what I mean by many minds. I want you to think about the fact that each of us is capable of awareness of levels of self and the ability to choose one level of self by which we observe the cosmos. This power of subjective observation really because it's each of us doing this ourselves. No one's telling us how to do it. This is where the free will comes in. It may seem obvious, may actually seem mundane. Like yeah yeah we know that. Don't even go into this. It's obvious right? It's so obvious, but it's so basic, and it's so crucial, because this key to recognizing which level of self you're choosing for yourself, which observation point, that holds the entire key to the kingdom of mind-matter interaction. That's everything. So that's all levels of reality. You might say to yourself that subjective observation actually holds the key to reality itself, and it does. So. What do I mean by that? I'm talking now about awareness. And at an ultimate level, the only actions of substances are changes of perception. Uh, this is a very philosophical statement. If you're thinking, that sounds like philosophy. Yes, it is. And this was of a matter of great interest to one of my favorite philosophers, Leibniz. And he viewed apperception as consciousness or the reflective knowledge of this internal state. He adds that this is something not given to all souls, nor at all times to a given soul. So, obviously, sometimes we get caught up in the moment, in the drama, and we're not thinking clearly, we're not choosing for ourselves how to be really conscious. We're operating on autopilot. We're freaking out, maybe. Hopefully not. Hopefully not very often. <laughs> but it can happen to the best of us. So if it does happen, and it might, just move right on. Just go through it. Just like if you're playing music and you're a musician, you don't stop and start over. I mean, you might, but if it's a big performance, just keep going right on through. This is your life. This is a big performance. It's the real thing. So the skill of being self-aware can actually be further developed through meditation. And this is where you can learn that you are not your thoughts. You're not your feelings. What do you mean? I, <laughs> if I'm saying that, you're like, what are you talking about? Well, you know you're not because you're able to observe those. You're able to take a step back in a meditation and actually look and see what is, for example, Cynthia thinking right now. And I'm thinking this is the first time I've ever recorded on this different device and I hope it's going well. <laughs> so that's on, in, on top of everything else. But I know that's not me. That's just a thought that happened to pop up right then. I'm observing it like I'm observing making sure that I cover this material I wanted to cover today. At this important, pivotal moment in human history, it really is. We're getting the chance of a lifetime to choose, not just for ourselves, but for the whole planet. What happens next? We're each having a big role to play in that. You are, I am, we all are. So this idea that we're not our thoughts and feelings, it's just taking a step back. When you do that, who are you? If you're not your thoughts and feelings, what is this self behind those thoughts and feelings, and you can keep going back. Advanced meditators can just keep stepping back, stepping back. You notice layers and um, like selves, uh, multiples of selves. And we're not going to go into all of that right now, but the idea here that's simple is just notice that you can observe. Therefore, you can identify with that pure consciousness that is the observer. You can choose to be above the drama, the crisis, if you will. And this is where the observer effect comes in. I do like to bring up quantum physics. I've got a degree in physics from UC Berkeley. So uh, what I mean by the observer effect is that as an observer uh, uh, watches any given experiment, such as last year, I considered the biggest experiment of 2019 to be the work that was done in the laboratory 
Um, it was a cooperative <laughs> work, a collaboration between Austria and Edinburgh, Scotland. And so Vienna and, Aust and Edinburgh, the scientists in both cities, joined together to ask themselves, what happens if we create an experiment where we've got two obser observational devices at the same place, same time, we think maybe if quantum physics is as weird as we think it is, and it's pretty weird, we're not going to see exactly the same observation. And sure enough, one observational device was able to observe a certain state of the given particle in the given double slit experiment. The other one was observing a different um, state entirely. It was just not decided. One's a particle, the other's like pure wave function. And therefore, two different observations at the exact precise same moment in time. So where does this take us? It takes us back to subjective reality. Obviously, if we can have that kind of thing going on where there's one absolute definite observation and then one very fluctuating wave-like observation at the same place, at the same time, we're in the whole realm of subjective reality. That means there's not one perfect reality that we can always agree on. We instead each have our own subjective realities. And so this comes into the idea of many minds. And um, when we look at some of the Mandela effects that a lot of the community of reality shifters and Mandela affected people are noticing, they will see some examples that show lots of different observational states, including what we call flip-flops, where you can sometimes see one observation and then it changes to something else and goes back again. Um, people notice this with the Chick-fil-A restaurant, um, whether it was C-H-I-C, Phil A, or C-H-I-C-K, or C-H-I-K. It was just going back and forth and all over. And that's interesting because it's showing that as we're observing, we can get real-time shifts. I've seen those myself. And getting back to this topic of what's meaningful right now in this moment in history, again, it's the whole idea that the so-called unity of consciousness is an illusion, albeit a very persistent one to, <laughs> to riff off Albert Einstein. So yes, it's persistent. We tend to see, keep thinking, I wanna go back to my reality. I want the world the way it was. Okay, maybe we're not going there, but being as we are, maybe in a sand trap of life, we've golfed ourselves into you know a difficult situation. No biggie, we'll get out. The way we do it, just keep asking how good can it get? And the key now is just getting back into that state of love. I wanna just, um, if, you're, if you're still feeling like you're having trouble with this many selves thing, let's go to psychology for a moment and talk about an experience Carl Jung had and why he probably was as interested as he was in the multitudes of selves and this idea of the collective unconscious and what's going on with all that. He was fascinated by it because um, he actually would observe um, that he had a female cousin. She was age 15 when she started exhibiting signs of multiple personality. So she would become suddenly pale and sink to the ground or some nearby chair. And then she'd talk completely differently than she usually did. Instead of her usual Swiss dialect, she would speak literary German in a smooth and assured manner. Various spirits claimed to speak through her mouth and her mannerisms changed completely or took over. Of the various so-called spirits that spoke through her, uh, we heard a report from Colin Wilson that told us one of them claimed to be her grandfather who had been a banal and sanctimonious clergyman. Another was an inane chatterer who flirted with the ladies who came to the seances. Another claimed to be a nobleman he was an amusing gossip. He spoke high German with a North German accent. And Carl Jung observed that when his cousin was holding these seances, she took on a countenance quite different than, um, you know, pretty much from her normal appearance, from her normal manner. She could talk so seriously, so forcefully and convincingly that one almost had to ask oneself, is this really a girl of 15 and a half? One had the impression that a mature woman was acting out with considerable dramatic talent. Jung took detailed notes at these seances, and then later, after he studied with Pierre Genet in Paris in 1902, he expanded them into a doctoral thesis that he wrote for his medical degree. In Jung's first published work, he wrote on the subpersonalities and other dissociative phenomena produced by his psychic cousin during her mediumistic seances. So I'm bringing this up because Carl Jung clearly could see that there was something going on in this one cousin of his. Um, there's a tendency that we all have to split into various aspects of our psyche. We can become the, 
you know, the, the toilet paper hoarder or whatever. You know, we can become the strong, confident one in the community. Uh, these are like roles that we play. They're just parts of ourselves, but they're not really psychopathology. It happens in all of us. So it's usually not talked about, it's not observed, but I'm bringing it up because it's super important to the point that neuropsychologist Roger Wolcott Sperry won the Nobel Prize in 1981 for his discoveries concerning functional specialization in the two hemispheres of our brain. He noticed that we've got two selves right here inside of our mind. So even if you're a physicalist, even if you think it's just the brain, even so, there's two different sides of yourself. Because patients with split brain syndrome would experience one side of their body operating separately from the other. In some rare cases, this kind of split personality or dual consciousness has been observed with people who have this split brain syndrome, with each hemisphere and side of the body responding very differently from the other. Now that's kind of unusual, very dramatic, <coughs> but clearly it shows us that our split brains employ a dual approach to simultaneously appraising situations and bringing it all together. One side of our brain, if you will, is very rational. One side is very intuitive. And we usually think it's just me. It's just one mind. But I'm suggesting today, maybe not. And if you know that it's not just one, what does that give you? It gives you choice. And I think one of the biggest ways to get back into the power of this observer effect is to realize that right now, right here, you have the choice to make to choose your best possible self, even if you don't know what it is. There's a part of you that does know. And you can just say right here, right now, I am my best possible self. I choose that. So until next time, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with Reality Shifters, reminding you to ask every day, in every way, how good can it get? Thanks so much.